Okay, everybody, um, welcome to this first session of uh, the Battle of Ideas, Going Nowhere, Staying Local in the Global Village. My name's Peter Smith. I'm the Director of Tourism at St. Mary's University College. The idea of this debate um, is really to explore um, mobility, the, glo the global and the local. And it stems from the idea that at precisely the time where people have the opportunity to be more, to be more global, in terms of travel, in terms of living, in terms of working, studying, communicating, etc. At precisely the time where things are more global, there's an increasing focus on the local. The argument would be that people should think globally, act locally, live locally, but also be engaged in the world. So there seems to be a sort of disjuncture between both the world being smaller in many ways, in terms of travel and mobility, but also increasing demands that we should look more closely at the local, spend more time locally, buy locally, holiday locally, maybe. Almost 10 years ago now, I, I was involved in an OECD project called Environmentally Sustainable Transport. It was a collection of uh, eight mostly European countries concerned about energy consumption and CO2 emissions in transport. And they had been working for a number of years before I got involved. And they, had, they were working with four scenarios. The first one they called business as usual. That was effectively the resolution of the project. They concluded that business as usual was not possible. They had another scenario that they called technical fix, making engines cleaner and quieter and more efficient. The third one they called restraint, traveling around less. And the fourth one was a mixture of fix and restraint, which they, uh, in the end, went with because they thought that was the most politically realistic. At that point, they uh, decided they wanted a commentary on the social consequences of their scenarios. And I got the job of writing that report. And I had a terrible time getting started uh, because the, the, the fix and restraint scenarios were banging heads. Everything proposed by the fixers was weakening the force of the levers on which the restrainers were pulling. If, if you make uh, transport cheaper, more efficient, you make it cheaper, and that encourages more of it. Um, and so in the end, I broke free of this problem by inventing the pollution-free perpetual motion engine. And uh, I ended up entitling my report, giving, giving them all those, uh, making all those concessions. Uh, the title of my report was The Social Consequences of Hypermobility. And I illustrated it with a, a, a graph of um, British transport statistics. But, uh, the, the graphs brought to the table by all the other participants looked remarkably similar. Uh, I went back to 1950 when the average Briton traveled five miles a day. Uh, uh, now it's well over 30 miles a day, by including flying, and forecast by 2025 to be over 60 miles a day. Um, and over that period of time, uh, walking and cycling um, and use of um, public transport buses in particular was, was in decline and, and there was rapid growth of travel by car and plane. Uh, so I, I uh, simply, for purposes of writing my report, uh, listed some of the consequences of these trends continuing. So since the earliest days of, of the transport revolution, the upward rising graph has been labeled progress. Uh, progress now seems to be acquiring a question mark. And the graph as it shoots off the top of the page is what I call the hypermobile world. And uh, the question I think we have to confront is where um, does progress end? Where, where do we stop trying to be ever increasingly mobile? So the hypermobile society is certainly more dispersed. There are more cars in it. Uh, and the government is trying to uh, keep that increasing. The one thing they did in addition to bailing out the banks was the other main initiative was cash for clunkers, trying to prop up the car industry to keep it going. Uh, it will be more socially polarized. As the average number of miles traveled um, per citizen per day increases, the variance about that average increases. Those who don't have access to cars or can't afford flying, they become second-class citizens dependent for their mobility on the withered remains of public transport or the goodwill of car owners. Uh, <clears throat> more dangerous, um, more metal in motion on the, on, on the roads out there. Uh, more hostile to children. Uh, one of the um, 
best documented features of the uh, this uh, growth in in uh, car traffic um, s since uh, the the documentation that I'm referring to started in 1971. Mayor Hillman did a study and. Uh, from that study, uh, he noted that 80% um, of seven and eight year old school children got to school on their own, unaccompanied by an adult. By 1990, when we re-ran his survey in the same five schools, uh, it was down from 80% to 9%. And now, um, uh, the freedom of children to get around on their own has become a child protection issue. I'm sure you will have read in the paper about um, the uh, the seven-year-old girl in Lincolnshire who, who was, whose parents were threatened with a child protection order for allowing her to walk, I think it was 20 meters to the school bus. Uh, so that, there has been a huge loss of children's independent mobility, which I think can be laid at the door of, of increasing car traffic. Um, be fatter and less fit, there's uh, it's often debate about whether the, uh, the obesity epidemic is down to junk food or uh, lack of exercise, it's probably both, uh, but certainly children today are getting uh, far less exercise than they used to. I spoke about the, the growth of the culture. Uh, culture uh, tends to be uh, increasingly bland and similar wherever you go in the world. The, the world would become more anonymous and less convivial. Every year fewer people can attach a name to their next door neighbor. We're, we're living more and more amidst strangers as we're zooming about in cars and planes. Uh, we're spending less time closer to home, uh, the, the, and that's draining the life out of the, uh, out of the traditional geographical community. We're living more and more in virtual communities of interest. Uh, more crime-ridden, uh, not necessarily with more crime, but more fear of crime. Uh, again, uh, I think that can be related to the loss of trust that goes with uh, living in increasingly anonymous societies. Um, and that hugely changes the style of policing. If the villains are taking, act, taking advantage of, of modern technology and, and, and cars and, and the internet and all of that, and the police don't keep up with their increasingly Orwellian style of uh, policing with CCTV, and, and now we read they're going to keep track of all our emails and internet access and phone calls, how do you police it, an anonymous society unless you keep track of who's doing what within this anonymous mob? Finally, less democratic. As we become more mobile, the, the scale of, the, uh, of, of government has to expand. If we, if we cross traditional authority boundaries, the, the scale of problems that need governing enlarges. Uh, and if the scale of government doesn't grow, then, then uh, uh, government becomes impotent, and so we have witnessed this migration of uh, political power, authority, responsibility from, from Town Hall to Whitehall to Brussels, and ultimately to completely undemocratic organizations like the World Trade Organization. Um, and that, uh, I, I think, uh, drains belief in the political system, certainly drains our belief in the possibility of having any sort of influence over it. Uh, over the over a 10-year period, I used to straw poll all of, at some point in the year, all of my students, can you give me the name of a single European MP who represents you? In 10 years, I got precisely one student who could name one Euro MP. <laughs> uh, that's not democracy as I remember it. Uh, I'll stop there. My, Michelle, um, you represent everybody involved in the mobile industry, certainly on, on international in terms of flying and... and, and you know, how would you answer the charge you're contributing to this hypermobile world and all the, the list of crimes <laughs> which John's outlined? Uh, well, we are, obviously. <laughs> uh, we're enabling uh, the mobility. But, I, you know, from, from, from our point of view, from, from my point of view, I see that as a very positive influence. And, of course, you know, there, there'll be issues that have to be addressed. But, but in general, I think that the mobility um, that, that we've achieved... Um, which is sometimes called the democratization of, uh, of air travel, um, has been um, very positive in terms of the broadening of, of our cultural references. You know, 
you know, across the board. And there, there's a kind of tendency to be a little bit snobbish about that, uh, you know, uh, certainly from the, from the opponents of air travel who think that, you know, it's, you, know you can't really include... You know, stag do's to Prague within within that kind of kind of cultural uh, reference, but actually, you know, I think there's room for, for all of those sorts of experiences, and uh, and I would say that, that that generally we're a better place for being a more multicultural, more more global, more uh, you know, more connected world. But I, I mean, I, what I wanted to do was just kind of paint two quick vignettes, mm -hmm. actually, which I think you know, kind of give you pause for, for thought about the kind of, the kind of knee-jerk reaction uh, and sometimes the unintended consequences of thinking that we should, we should all stay, stay where we are. Um, the first is, is a, a kind of an explanation of why Flying Matters includes um, organisations who work with farmers in the developing world. Um, back in 2007, when the sort of debate around aviation and the environment was at its hottest, uh, it's kind of calmed down a teeny bit since then, not much, but a bit, uh, the Soil Association uh, thought it would be a great idea to propose that it removed organic status from air freighted fresh produce. They thought that the debate was at such a, a point that it would be extremely popular, uh, you know, it would be backed by The Guardian and The Independent, which it, it, it was to begin with. And then they realised that actually, the people who would be worst off would be farmers in sub-Saharan Africa, farmers in Latin America, who add value to their produce by uh, cutting it, by producing it, and selling it mostly to Europe and, and the UK. They've invested an enormous amount in, in achieving organic status, uh, the badge that the Soil Association uh, wanted to give them and that they actually had no other means of earning a living. And what the Soil Association did by proposing to remove move organic status from, from the, that, that produce was actually push the farmers in the developing world into my arms. I had them banging on the door to come and join our coalition. And together, uh, we started explaining what the impact would be um, for, those, for those people uh, who would be affected by that. It largely was a protectionist issue um, British farmers, British organic farmers uh, didn't like the fact that, that a lot of uh, produce coming from sub-Saharan Africa was cheaper, even though it was organic, it was, it was still cheaper than British organic produce, and there was, a, that, there was that, that at work. Um, the Soil Association were accused by, by some of the, the media of being racists, um, and lo and behold, they decided to drop the proposal in favour of working with farmers in the developing world to ensure that they were achieving a sustainable uh, a, a kind of for, uh, field to fork process as possible. And the other one, uh, which um, Peter kind of highlighted a little bit at the beginning, it was, it was, is related to the hike in air passenger duty, which comes into force on Monday. It's the third or fourth hike in air passenger duty, which is the tax that uh, everybody flying from the UK uh, pays. And it's going up significantly. And there are places in the world which are almost entirely dependent on tourism, and a significant proportion of that from the, from the UK and from, from Europe. Uh, the Caribbean is one of those areas. The Caribbean has mobilized all of its ministers and prime ministers and is running a, a campaign to, to have that tax dropped because they are on... Because the impact on the reducing number of visitors from the UK because of the significant increase in the cost of flying there, because that people from the UK can choose to, you know, if they're holidaying, generally they can choose to go elsewhere. If they're visiting family, they might not go as often as, uh, as they would like to go. That drop in visitors for them is such a significant impact on their economy that it could put, the, 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 the way it's been explained to me by, by ministers from the Caribbean is that it actually could tip them over the edge uh, economically. And... Again, it's, it's one of those areas which it seems like a great idea. Let's, you know, uh, um, you know, we, uh, John was talking at the beginning about the kind of, you know, the, the scenarios set out, you know, the restraints versus the fix. Well, the restraint is usually done with taxation, taxation or reducing infrastructure so people physically can't get on a plane. And that's one, that's just one uh, example of what happens when you, when you follow through with that proposal. Um, you know, we've argued that it's socially aggressive. I have some polling which Populous has done for us, did for us last weekend, which it illustrates that uh, poor people are at least twice as likely as well-off people to be priced out of flying because of the tax rises. And basically, you know, we are looking at 
uh, moving back to a time when only the rich could afford to fly. And I think that's an incredibly socially regressive move. You know, even if we want to be snob snobbish about, you know, people just going to Spain, I still think that that's a positive, a positive thing. And if we if we we move back to that time, I think we will only see negative a negative impact from that. How would you answer the charge, you know, come on, you're just a bit of an industry stooge, really? Fly Matters represents a very broad coalition. We represent trade unions, TUC, uh, a number of individual unions are also members of Flying Matters. Uh, we represent farmers in the developing world, businesses, as well as the, 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 the travel industry. And, of course, the travel industry have got, a, a, have got a, you know, a, an economic stake. But I come at this from a... You know, I mean, I shouldn't really be embarrassed. Is that from quite a political point of view? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think yeah. as, I, as I've tried to explain, kind of at the beginning, I think that the benefits of mobility by far outweigh the negative impacts, and that you know, curtailing access, affordable <coughs> access to air travel, you know, is a regressive move, which which will 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 pay a price for socially and, and certainly economically. Um, Peter, um, having come from a country where mobility is facilitated more perhaps than the UK, um, any, uh, any thoughts from yourself? I would like to begin um, telling you the story of yesterday. I needed 60 minutes uh, to fly from Hanover to London, and I needed two and a half hours to get from the airport to the hotel. So this is about the problems we have to solve in my uh, point of view. I will take my, my opening statement very short. Uh, what we are doing in Germany and especially in the state of Niedersachsen, uh, where I come from, uh, we see mobility as a base for trading. And when you ask a bit of a philosophy, uh, uh, of a, a question of philosophy, what distincts uh, human beings from animals, um, I, in my opinion, it's trading. And mobility is a base of uh, trading. And we need uh, to trade. We need to trade goods as well as concepts and ideas. That's the type of economic behavior which creates wealth. And therefore, we need more mobility and not less, but we need also better mobility. So uh, my point of view is uh, that we have to optimize mobility in several criteria. It's about speed. It's about travel time. Uh, we don't need high-speed uh, uh, cars or something like this, but we need seamless mobility. So we can better uh, travel using different modes. And uh, we need a more efficient and therefore more cheaper uh, mobility. And we need uh, a resilient mobility. So this, this is what we have to tackle. These are the problems we have to tackle. And uh, I think the solution is uh, based on uh, technology as well as, as, well as uh, on uh, mo new mobility concepts. Philly, um, your books, Open World, and Immigrants, Your Country Needs Them, very much you know, in praise of globalization, mobility, etc. And I think your, I've got a little quote, says, particularly with the Emirates Professor of Geography, the beauty of globalization is that it can free people from the tyranny of geography. Sure. <laughs> Ever since the uh, invention of the wheel, um, human progress can be measured um, by increases in the speed, affordability, and ease of mobility. So if you think we're going further, faster, cheaper, and better, it's what mankind has tried to do uh, throughout uh, recorded history. And yet now, uh, at the cusp of the 21st century, we have this toxic backlash um, against uh, modern mobility. And it's striking, even the conservatives. The conservatives mm -hmm. used to be uh, the party that championed driving uh, and flying. And now you have Boris Johnson uh, trumpeting his new um, cycling scheme, uh, and his aim is for to turn the clock back to uh, 1904, when 20% of the trips uh, in London uh, were done by bike. And he, he, he quipped at the time, said, what's the point of being a conservative uh, if you can't try to turn the clock back uh, to 1904? <laughs> um, then you see David Cameron. I mean, he took his summer holiday uh, in Britain this year. Obviously, partly that was... Um, uh, of political tokenism, but he's urging other people to do likewise, a form of um, uh, protectionism. And then you see, you know, the, the, the new government cancelling plans for the uh, third runway at Heathrow and also cancelling plans for any other airport in London um, uh, to expand. Then there's the high-speed rail link, you know, 
China's building 10,000 miles of ultra-high-speed um, uh, rail by 2012. And we are planning to build our first high-speed rail link north by 2027. Um, and even that might not happen because the route goes through um, lots of conservative constituencies um, and uh, the conservative MPs are up in arms, um, you know, nimbious protesters, protesters saying, well, you know, we don't want the line going through um, our constituency. Thank you very much. And then, of course, we live in an age of austerity. And if you look at the cuts which have come through, transport uh, has fallen victim particularly um, to these swinging budget cuts. Now, you might hope that the left... Uh, would be opposing this. I mean, after all, the left is was traditionally um, uh, the, on the side of progress. Uh, Harold Wilson was talked about you know, harnessing the white heat uh, of technology, um, and yet Ed Miliband seems more um, concerned uh, with its carbon footprint. Or you see anti-poverty campaigners. They ought to want people in China, India, and other poor countries um, uh, to enjoy many of the things uh, that uh, we take for granted. I mean, ultimately, for me, that's what anti-poverty campaigning is about. Instead, actually, now they're decrying the fact that uh, the Chinese want to drive or they want to uh, take a plane. I mean, how shocking. They want to do the same things uh, that we do. Um, and then you see extremists, you know, people like George Monbiot. He's even opposed to high-speed rail. I mean, it's astonishing. He wrote a piece in The Guardian saying, you know, our dismally, dismally so trains are actually a wonderful thing. Um, and basically, if you bring it all together, it's kind of go slow, stay put, uh, limit yourself uh, to local. Um, their vision of the eco-romantic vision of the good life seems to be swapping um, the global uh, village uh, for um, a medieval one. Now, I'm not saying that environmental costs don't exist. Of course they do. They're real. We all know that if you live under the, um, near Heathrow, the plane noise is terrible. We all know that car pollution um, is awful. We all get, anyone gets frustrated getting, by getting stuck uh, in traffic jams. And yes, of course, climate change could also have a devastating impact uh, in future. But what's missing in this debate is a sense of the huge benefits um, of mobility, not just economic, uh, but also um, social uh, and cultural. I mean, cars are a huge liberating force. You know, they allow people uh, to go where they want, when they want. It's opened up a whole new range uh, of jobs that you can commute to, a whole new range of shops uh, that uh, you can um, uh, shop at, um, a whole new range of places that you can go. Or travel. I mean, we take foreign travel for granted. Um, but it's absolutely amazing uh, that, you're able, that you can you know, have your te take your holidays in Spain, uh, that you can experience um, a different country uh, and uh, what that culture teaches you about our own. Of course, it permits also international trade, not just good for us, but, uh, as Michelle pointed out, vital for developing countries. Um, and now international commuting. Now, that's, the rich have been doing that for a while. You know, international bankers hop back and forth between um, London and New York, uh, Tokyo and Singapore. And yet now that um, uh, you know, less well-off people are doing it, people are up in arms. You know, Polish people who commute back and forth um, on uh, Ryanair and people think it's a terrible thing. And that brings me to you know, what is perhaps the crux of this debate, which is that you know, now in, this, in the age of Ryanair, in the age of the 1,000 pound Tata Nano car, mobility has been democratized. You know, mobility used to be, it started, tra you know, um, international travel um, and tourism started off as aristocrats going around on the grand tour of Europe. So basically it was the George Osborne's of the day uh, spending a year you know, getting pissed sleeping with prostitutes and doing a bit of culture. Um, uh, and again, cars started off as um, the privilege of a tiny few. And now, you know, increasingly, um, uh, foreign travel uh, and cars um, are accessible not just to nearly everyone in rich countries, but also to increasing numbers of people um, uh, in uh, developing countries. And for me, that's a fantastic thing. I mean, it's incredibly uh, liberating uh, and it's anyone who believes in any form of equality ought to be uh, celebrating that. As, um, yeah, as Peter said in his introduction, it offers liberation uh, from uh, the tyranny of geography, whereby where you were born determines what your life chances are. I mean, if you, you might have heard of a book called The World is Flat um, by uh, Tom Friedman. Uh, and that was a bestseller. 
Uh, and it seems, you know, many people took his message um, uh, as being an obvious truth. But the reality is that the world is not flat uh, at all. Uh, you know, the, the biggest single determinant of how well someone does in, in life is not how talented they are, it's not how um, hard they work, it's where they were born and who their parents are. And uh, being able to move to a different country um, can help overcome uh, that uh, huge disadvantage. So that, if, if anything, is the biggest benefit um, of mobility. So what does that mean? We've got huge benefits of mobility, and we've also um, got uh, environmental costs. What do we do? Well, the essential way forward is not to try and limit mobility, it's try to minimize uh, those costs. So we should be building um, more railways, uh, more um, runways, but we should also be developing quieter planes, which we are. We should also be developing more fuel efficient planes, which we are. We should be also developing new f fuel sources, which we are. There, there was recently the first um, flight ever with a plane fueled by algae. <coughs> Um, likewise, um, we, people should be able to drive uh, wherever they want, um, but we should have cars with cleaner engines and uh, with electric batteries. And again, those new technologies are being developed. And yes, you know, cycling is great. I mean, it's bloody dangerous in London, but um, it's great. No, no, nothing wrong with cycling at all. But it is not. It should. It should be a complement, not an alternative, to investing. Uh, in faster trains, in better tube lines, um, in new bridges, flyovers, uh, tunnels, uh, and the like. Um, we don't have to choose, uh, ultimately, uh, between uh, growth and greenery. I think that's a false choice. Instead, we need to be developing new technologies. We need to be tapping the limit limitless energy uh, of the sun, uh, the wind, and the atom. And like that, uh, we can have all uh, the benefits of, of, of mobility. Um, uh, and uh, 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 without uh, the environmental costs. Thank you. Two points, if I may. I wonder if you can address a little bit more detail around congestion, because um, that's one of the, the biggest issues uh, as I see it. I don't particularly want to go back to 1904 either, but if more people were cycling in London, it would probably increase the speed of journey times rather than uh, uh, decrease it. Um, I think average speed in London for journeys is judged to be between about eight and 12 miles an hour, uh, even without using bicycles. Have any of the measures that have recently been adopted to restrict travel had any effect whatsoever? You might argue that you know, a pound here and there on a short haul flight will have a peripheral uh, impact. But when you're looking at you know, 300, 600 pounds for a family of four to go to India, that does have a significant impact, and we've done quite a lot of research. We've done research with the National Centre for Social Research, which is the leading social research body in the UK, which demonstrates that, uh, that, that, that there are specific price points at which um, people decide that flying is too expensive for them, and they certainly do less of it. Um, and you know, you, there's no surprise that people in lower income brackets are the, the first ones who are priced out. But interestingly, you know, the higher the price hike goes, what happens is that richer people don't stop flying, they just choose to fly to cheaper destinations. So they don't, they don't lose out, actually, in the end. I think the two questions uh, are a little bit com combined. We, we have uh, made the experience in, in Germany that uh, we have also congestions, uh, congestion problems uh, uh, of our, on our highways, uh, but people do not react. Uh, people will drive. Uh, if there is con congestion or no, they, they use their cars. So more, conge more congestion is not a, a, a measure to prevent people from using a car. That's our experience we made. And therefore, we use uh, some uh, type of uh, dynamic uh, traffic management uh, at the moment. As for, for example, as you may know, we do not have a general speed limit in Germany on our highways. You can say uh, to avoid uh, uh, traffic jam, to avoid uh, congestion, uh, you have to restrict mobility. But our experience is that that will not uh, help. Uh, you have to, to make uh, mobility uh, more seamless. This, this will help. Surely the idea of rich and poor and you know, increasing divisions between rich and poor as a consequence of mobility is something you highlighted. Do you think that's the main feature or do you think there are a whole range of other things? I think it's certainly a feature. Um, the, I'm not entirely against all technology. Um, I've just got a new app 
for the Boris bike scheme, and there's a stand outside in front, and mm -hmm. uh, on my uh, iPhone app, it tells me there are eight bikes available on 15 free parking spaces. And it's a brilliant scheme, um, and uh, they're not dangerous. Cars are dangerous, guns are dangerous, but hardly any pedestrians are ever killed by bikes. Since 1950, there has been more than a tenfold increase in the number of cars in the world, and the number of people in the world without cars has doubled population increase. And most people in the world have never flown um, and are unlikely to, to ever fly. So, so the, um, certainly so long as population continues to grow, uh, the cars and planes are, are becoming more and more elitist, not, not less so. I feel like I'm in the rerun of the OECD project over 10 years ago and I'm in the middle of a, a group of technical fixers who, who are looking at this problem uh, only in terms of, of uh, technical fix. Um, and yes, I agree with you. In, throughout the whole of recorded history, up until quite recently, increasing mobility was considered progress. And I, I've already said I wouldn't want to live in the hypomobile pedestrian peasant village. Uh, but I, 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 I'm, I'm inviting you to imagine, can these trends continue ad infinitum? Um, yes, I think it can, and I think it is. Indefinitely. Um, indefinitely. Yes, indefinitely. Um, I think, I mean, you, the, the first question was about congestion. Um, and since we're in London, uh, you see, first of all, that um, through the congestion charge, actually London roads are less congested than they were 10 years ago. Second of all, if we built more tube lines and put more buses on the road, um, we could move around people much better and much less congested. And that's not a pipe dream. You look at um, uh, Paris. Paris is more densely populated uh, than London is. Um, and yet the Paris metro uh, is not as congested as ours. Why? Because they've built more um, metro lines, uh, they've invested in new technology, whether, whereas we have scrimped and saved. At which point the new line is, well, we just simply can't afford to build new tube, mm -hmm. tube lines, we can't afford to build infrastructure. Well, first of all, um, that, that's, that's simply not true because um, building infrastructure creates future growth and therefore future taxes. And secondly, if you wanted to fund it here and now, you could do it through a land tax. If you look at the, um, uh, ex the Jubilee Line extension, uh, from, uh, which was built to Canary Wharf, it cost three and a half billion uh, in public money. And yet it raised the surrounding land value, the value of the businesses and the homes nearby, by 10 billion. So if the government tax away some of that gain, which comes entirely due to the, um, uh, due to the infrastructure, it could pay for um, uh, infrastructure, it, it could pay for massive investment in infrastructure and has the added benefit at the moment, we're trying to find ways of getting out of recession, um, of boosting growth. So you can drive with a car to a tube station, you have a parking space there and then use the tube to go into the city. That's very attractive and uh, that's uh, our experience in Germany. This is a concept uh, which can help. Well, the final point, um, uh, it's my mind-boggling point again. If growth continues at 3% per year ad infinitum, uh, that's a rate that uh, uh, over a 100 year period uh, uh, increases by a factor of about 20. Now, maybe you have a more active and vivid imagination than I do, <laughs> but I cannot imagine those trends. Uh, oh, and, and also, um, the, um, historically, there has been an extraordinarily strong correlation between GDP and uh, passenger miles and ton miles, because GDP is uh, essentially a measure of, of um, extracting raw materials, processing them, and redistributing to final consumers. So that correlation, um, I struggle to see how it's going to be broken. Uh, in the OECD project, we talked about mm -hmm. uh, electronic mobility being a substitute for physical mobility, and yes, uh, it, it, it can substitute for certain video conferencing, can substitute for, for some business trips. And, and maybe Skyping, uh, you can see the person you're talking to. Um, but uh, in the project, we agreed that the, there was, was and remains a strong positive correlation between the amount of uh, uh, electronic mobility and the amount of physical mobility. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, it's more of a stimulus to travel than a, than a, uh, a substitute for it. And um, my anecdotal support for that 
um, in a course on hypermobility, I found myself in Vancouver Airport, <laughs> uh, waiting to fly back to London, got chatting to the fellow sitting next to me. He was going to fly to Toronto to play bridge with somebody from Toronto, somebody from San Francisco, and somebody from Edinburgh. They had met and played bridge on the internet, and now they needed a real game. You might not be able to imagine growth of 3% a year continuing, but if you look back 150 years ago, this was before electricity, it was before um, just the beginning of trains, it was certainly before uh, uh, cars um, and planes, it was certainly before um, uh, telephones uh, and the internet, um, it was before space travel, it was before all sorts of things which have happened. Um, I think that through human ingenuity, we're going to create over the next 100 years all sorts of technologies um, some of which we can think of now um, but aren't able to do, and other things which we probably haven't even thought of um, uh, at all. Um, and uh, I'm confident that, um, that we're going to be able to do so for a very simple reason. Um, that first of all, there is no limit to human ingenuity. And second of all, that until recently, we were tapping um, the brain power of only a tiny, tiny fraction of humanity, basically, um, the people in uh, rich countries who were lucky enough to go to university were, were, were generating um, um, most scientific progress. Uh, now you, you see that not just democratized um, across um, uh, people in advanced economies, uh, but also uh, across the emerging world. So you see uh, Wang Chuang Fu, um, who, who set up a company called BYD, which is a global leader in electric cars. He grew up in a um, uh, on a farm in extreme poverty uh, in a country where enterprise was forbidden, uh, China. Uh, and now, look where he's got, he's created these technologies um, uh, which um, are not just revolutionary uh, in China, but revolutionary uh, for the whole world. Multiply that by all the talented people there are uh, in India, um, and one day all the talented people there are in, in, um, uh, in Africa too, uh, Latin America and so on. Uh, there are loads and loads and loads of new ideas um, out there just waiting um, uh, to become uh, technologies uh, that make us all uh, better off. So I am, a, I am an optimist and I believe uh, that progress can continue. Let me come briefly to, to, to immigration. Do we want people to be more mobile? Uh, yes, certainly we do. I mean, immigration is not just a fundamental human right, um, uh, a, a huge expansion um, of freedom. Uh, it's also, um, uh, you know, gives people uh, the opportunity um, of a better life, uh, something that we um, in the West take for granted. And actually, mobility as opposed to migration can also make a huge difference because we no longer live in a world where migration is a movement of permanent settlement. We live in increasingly in a world where people can go back and forth. And you see, for example, um, there are Polish doctors who work during the week uh, in Poland, live with their family there, don't have to uproot themselves, and then on the weekend, they come to Britain, fly over, and do provide the out-of-hours care which our GPs in this country don't want to provide. It makes them much better off because in, those, in the, the odd weekend that they work in London, they earn, or elsewhere in the country, they earn lots of money. It provides out-of-hours out of care for people who otherwise wouldn't receive it. And it's all possible uh, thanks to mobility. Today, I would like uh, to open your mind a little bit for the future. Think of a flying machine which is as easy to maintain and which is as cheap uh, 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 and which is as easy to learn as a car we have today. So such flying cars uh, could open up a new uh, mode of transport. And also think of space tourism, think of space planes. Uh, they are just at the beginning in 2012. Uh, they want to start from New Mexico, Richard Branson, which is a member, I think, of, of the, uh, which is a lord. It's Richard Branson, Lord, Lord Richard Branson, no? mm -hmm. which is a lot of, of your country. Uh, they will start uh, to uh, travel uh, uh, into space uh, with a, a sort of rocket plane, and such rocket planes can provide us with a new high-speed uh, link between continents. You can go with such a plane from London to New York in an, in an hour, and you can reach every point on the Earth from London in about two hours. So think about this might be the future we will see. Aviation is the one transport sector which pays for all of its own infrastructure uh, and currently government policy prevents it from investing in new infrastructure which could generate growth and generate uh, better connections with the, uh, the, the, the BRIC countries, the emerging markets. Um, so I think we should, we should think on that. Finally, I like often to frame this question in the form of three opinion polls. Opinion poll one, 
would you like to have a car, unlimited air miles, and Bill Gates style of access to the internet? That is the opinion poll that uh, underpins most transport planning in every country in the world. And overwhelmingly, you, uh, you put that question and you get a resounding yes. People imagine the world as it now is, but with them having access to this enlarged range of opportunities in life that go with greater mobility. If you ask a second question, would you like to live in the sort of world where everyone's wish were granted? And I've sketched out what seemed to me to be some of the social implications of, of, of that. Uh, and, uh, but politicians don't like that question because it implies the need for a grim, gray, virtuous self-denial in order to save the planet. But you could uh, put a third question, uh, which uh, rarely gets asked. Uh, would you like to live in the flip side of number two? Would you like to live in a, in a society where people knew their neighbors, it was safe for children to play in the street, uh, and, and uh, just the reverse side of all, the, of all those um, implications that I was worried about? Um, and if you put it that way, um, and uh, I think you would end up with a policy that cherished the local, put a higher value on, on local communities um, if they're in competition for a high-speed rail line that's going to uh, slice through them, uh, that would tip the balance more in favor of the local community and less in favor of uh, more high-speed mobility. I really don't. Okay, that's such a false choice. I know my neighbors and I travel around the world. I mean, I don't, I, they're, not, they're not at all inconsistent or incompatible. I mean, I really don't know where you're coming from. I'd like to know my neighbors, but they're always away on the weekend on EasyJet. <laughs> Please, can we thank our speakers? Thank you very much.